So, hi, uh, I'm Jason, and uh, I work uh, for Instructure, and uh, you're probably wondering, who is this guy? And so, you know, I am uh, a total data dork, and, I was, and, I just, and I'm the guy that really loves to talk about assessment. Uh, I have a, 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 just a thing when it comes to talk about the measurement and assurance of learning in the classroom. Uh, when the time came for my program self-study or regional accreditation, I was the weird guy who got excited. Um, because we got to figure out where we could improve in learning uh, in the department I used to teach in. Um, so that's me. Uh, I work for Instructure. I'm the guy responsible for all things related to assessment uh, inside of Canvas. That includes the new testing engine, uh, outcomes, rubrics, all that kind of fun stuff. I'm the, the, the lead over all of assessment platforms. And you can find me uh, on the interwebs uh, as Sparksopedia uh, on Twitter uh, if you want to follow me. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm originally from the People's Republic of Austin. Uh, I'm from Austin, Texas, originally. Uh, I got my start uh, as an associate professor at uh, Austin Community College and was the department chair for, of uh, pharmacy, uh, pharmacy technology and uh, taught pharmacy practice in law for several years. I was also an item writer for our licensure exam and moved to be director of professional affairs for the Pharmacy Technician Certification Board, which is where I got a uh, really deep dive into psychometrics. Um, anybody here a psychometrician? No? Okay. Awesome. Um, and then I moved, uh, I left PTCB uh, and staffed the hospital for a while and then went to go back to, to in education and was uh, division chair or dean of the health and academic sciences at Arkansas State University Mid-South. Uh, and then I moved to the George Washington University School of Business uh, in Washington, D.C. and I taught there for a while. Uh, and then um, I moved to the dark side, and uh, like I said, I made all my money in education and decided to retire and, and go work in uh, ed tech, which is totally not true. Uh, and so I, I moved to the dark side and worked in education technology. And then, uh, like you, I, I worked uh, for uh, other education technology companies, and then I saw the light and moved to Instructure. And um, have been at Instructure for uh, almost two and a half years, and was hired to, to rebuild and and, f and help uh, focus on assessment. And so uh, I, I, I uh, and my products and my team, we, we service Canvas uh, for all things assessment. And, we're also, and I'm also the creator of the new assessment management system called Gage that was announced at InstructureCon this last year. So a brand new way to deliver uh, decontextualized or common assessments across a, a department to a targeted group of students. So um, with that, uh, we can talk about uh, assessment. I wanted to give you a couple options. Um, I could either dive into some psychometrics if you want to know. Anybody here know what a Kronbach Alpha is and what it means? Couple, couple people? Okay. Uh, point by serial correlation coefficient. Anybody have a burning desire to know what that, what that, what that means? Um, we can talk about that briefly and then I figure we would uh, talk about the new testing engine in Canvas and I can give you a live demo of that tool as well. So um, what I'll do is I'll just kind of uh, skip through my slides and uh, we can talk about some high points of assessment and, and uh, using data for assessment uh, to improve instruction. And then we'll do, uh, uh, we'll do it live and do a demo of uh, our new testing engine. So, um, yeah, man, tests, you know, the, the most anxiety inducing process in the classroom or even in the department. And based upon the content of this presentation, I'll give you one guess. What is, what is the most anxiety-inducing process in the classroom, in your opinion? Yeah, it's assessment. Man, that's such a daunting thing, right? I mean, it's... Uh, he, he forgot there was a final uh, today. And so, um, he's walking into the classroom. Anyway, um, that GIF, which is uh, that GIF or GIF, depending upon what you... Um, if you want to say it the wrong way, it's GIF, and the right way is GIF. Um, but I won't have that debate today. Uh, this is from Italian Spider-Man. If you've never seen, them, seen that, it's the, probably one of the best horse movies ever made, apart from The Room. Um, so I highly recommend it. Um, so how can we alleviate this anxiety? Well, uh, as they, as to quote G.I. Joe, uh, knowing is half the battle, and that's pedagogy to the rescue. And so when we think about assessment, we really think about um, a variety of processes. And one is uh, one process and one solution really thinks about a potentiated potent response or um, a student's attitude walking into an assessment. And just by the language we use, that affects 
student performance. Girls aren't good at math and science. That is a threat. And students who believe those threats inherently do worse on assessment. And if we can rethink our language, what uh, Keegan and Leahy call the, the language of positive regard, we can actually think about how we improve assessment just by use of language. And uh, this is a really interesting study. It was a joint study uh, done uh, by two folks uh, through, through Northeastern University and Harvard. And it was essentially uh, the findings of the study indicated that if you use more positive language and avoid uh, the, 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 the threat of, langu uh, of language, like negative thinking, it's like, oh, I'm no good at this, or I'm terrible at that, or girls aren't good at math, and all men should just go be an electrical engineer. Um, thank you, Dad. Um, we, uh, we can um, be better at what we do uh, just through uh, more positive language. Um, and then uh, helping people be better prepared to, when they encounter such language increases their performance as well. Uh, it's a very interesting study and uh, definitely worth thinking about. And then there's the curve of forgetting. Uh, this is um, by, this study is from a guy named Ebbinghaus in the early 20th century. Um, are any of you familiar with constructivist theory in education? Um, this guy, Ebbinghaus, is one of the big influencers of Lev Vygotsky, uh, who was one of the, you know, the, the big principal thinkers in constructivist classrooms and scaffolding and ideas around building schema to reinforce content. Um, but this, is, this, this uh, chart talks about um, memorization, rote memorization, which only kind of gets you so far in learning. But um, this basically says that at the end of the lesson, students are going to know what they know. And then if they never encounter it again and don't study, then, you know, in the average of 30 days later, they're probably going to forget most of it, if not everything. But the more they encounter it, the less time it takes to study and actively recall that information. Uh, and this, this particular, uh, the research that Ebbinghaus did really focused on memorization, like reviewing of notes and highlighting, all of the older types of activities we would teach our students to use to, to study and learn about, uh, to remember and learn content. It's just like, you know, looking at notes, studying, un highlighting and underlining notes in your books. Um, and this data tells us that uh, the more a student does that, the less frequently they have to do it. Uh, and for the, I'm sorry, the more a student does it, the less time they have to do it. Uh, so they essentially get a lot of recall and remember information the more uh, they're exposed to that, and the more they're exposed to content uh, inside of, um, in, the, in their learning processes. Um, oh, that didn't come out very well. Um, but that's, and that's one way to think about it. There's other uh, research uh, that uh, reinforces that but extends it even more. Uh, there's two cognitive psychologists, uh, Harry Rodiger and Mark McDaniel, and they teach out of the Washington University, St. Louis, uh, and they're in the psychology department. And they did this multi-year study um, of active recall or testing. And if you've not read this book, I highly recommend it. It's a great book because it talks about their research. And the second chapter focuses on um, active recall or testing. And in this study, uh, they basically... Uh, talk, they basically conclude and have found that the more students are tested, even if it's low stakes or no stakes, even if it's just a one or two question quiz or five question quiz, the more they're tested, the better learners they become. Even if it's a zero stakes quiz. In fact, if it's the lower the stakes are, the better, they, the better it is. Because it's all about active recall. And in there, in the more you recall the information, uh, the better a student retains that information, and then they become more savvy learners, and they perform better on those higher stakes tests, even months, weeks, or months later. And so, um, when I was teaching, uh, we implemented some of this thinking, and we found that uh, our success rate on our national licensure exam increased by twenty percent. Uh, through implementing um, the more frequent lower stakes assessment in, in my pharmacy program and then also in the medical uh, assistant nursing program at, at A-State, we uh, were able to find 
a significant in increase. Uh, in the study uh, that they talk about here, uh, the control group uh, had an average of about C plus on uh, the higher stakes uh, assessment. The, uh, the group enga actively engaged in the research that had more frequent assessment, their average was A minus. So it's a significant increase in performance, <coughs> excuse me, um, just through more active recall. Uh, they also talked about um, changing the brain. The more you, and also that, uh, the, the uh, propotent potentiated response uh, around um, more uh, increase in, in, in assessment and that uh, the more you learn and the more positive approach you have to the learning process, your brain actually changes. The way you think and the way you think about thinking, cognition and metacognition actually changes to the point where you become a better learner. Um, and that it's not necessarily about your, um, you know, the, the ethereal predisp predisposed idea of this is what I want to be and I can't do anything else because this is what I'm really good at. Well, if we actually take the time and invest and become uh, a more positive and invested learner, uh, the way we think can actually significantly, can significantly change and we can, we can essentially do anything um, if you put your mind to it, if you pardon the cliche. So it's, it's a pretty fascinating uh, set of study. And uh, there's a, a really good video that talks, briefly talks about this. I can't show it to you. But it's, if you go to that link on the PBS website, it's a clip from NOVA, and it talks about the study done at Columbia Middle School in Columbia, Illinois. Uh, and that's where uh, that, that research and those uh, findings were made. But you, you and I all know that assessment really is a multi-purpose tool, and it serves more than one purpose in the classroom. And it could be a, a variety of things like uh, testing, attendance, uh, just-in-time, use for just-in-time teaching to adjust our lectures for uh, whatever the students think, whatever you see the students need to be reinforced when you look at the results of a, of a just-in-time quiz um, and all those types of things. So it, it really is multi-purpose. In fact, we, we know through a study, uh, through research that we found and also a study that we conducted, that uh, if we can engage students and provide them with more frequent feedback on their learning, um, just through frequent feedback, students' performance can increase by 28%. Furthermore, by empowering students to understand where they are in the process and where they need to go to be better learners and to perform better in a class. Uh, through that self-monitoring, we can increase performance by, an, uh, by up to 43%. So um, just by helping under a student understand the expectations of instruction, providing the students feedback from the instructional process, and then telling them, here's where you need to be, Here's the goal by helping them set goals, not necessarily how to get there, but where they need to be through setting goals. We help empower students uh, in learning uh, from a significant amount. Um, so there's been a, there was a study, or several studies actually, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s around computer-based testing, digital assessment. And the studies all said Computer-based testing is bad. Don't do it. Why? Why do you think that is? Yes. You're absolutely right. If I had a prize, you would get it. Thank you. Um, yes, exactly right. It's because, one, uh, computer-based testing was still a relatively new technology. Yes, it had been around for quite some time, but all of the user interfaces look something like this. And that was pretty terrible. And this is uh, pork or beef ipsum. Um, so if you want some funny filler text, this is pork ipsum. Um, so... Uh, yeah, it's because it was poor, poorly designed user interfaces that really focused on the content, but not necessarily providing an effective solution for teaching. And uh, as that technology has matured, uh, we now have the implementation of things like those technology-enhanced items, like drag-and-drop interactions and hotspot interactions and other ways to assess learning that um, actually has demonstrated that digital assessment really effective in learning because you have the ability to get assessment information and, um, and use it 
uh, to make a significant improvement to the instructional process uh, right away, uh, nearly instantly, which is pretty darn awesome. But um, using that data is hard. And getting to that point can be hard because there's a lot of work to get those things set up. And um, in, obviously this, this wasn't, in the, um, in a, the research that we've all, in the research that we, we commissioned, we found that 44% of teachers uh, use data to make decisions. But one in two struggle to use it effectively. So 44% of teachers use data to make decisions, but all, half of them don't necessarily understand the data that they're collecting and how to do that. So, and how to use it effectively to improve the instructional process. So, so how do we use assessment data to affect the, the process? And we can look at a, a variety of things like uh, the Kronbach Alpha, the point by serial, and the difficulty and discrimination indices, or even things at the top, you know, top level overall performance of, a, of an assessment like the distribution of scores, the high score, the low score, mean or average, or if you, you could even go to the median score to see um, where students are, deviation of scores, and then average attempt time. Those are like the data at the 36,000 36, foot level, so flying high in the airplane, kind of getting a, a, a ground view of the assessment data. But then you can get even more granular and actually look at how individual items are performing. And um, it's on obviously a format problem, I apologize for that. But there's like, things like the difficulty index, which is also known as the, the p-value. And the p-value um, really understands the comparison of correct and incorrect responses uh, for an assignment. How difficult was that item? And then there's the discrimination index, which compares the top performers in relationship to the bottom performers. So the p-value of the, of the upper performers and the p-value of the lower performers that provides you with a discrimination index, or how well did the item discriminate between those who knew the information and those who didn't. Um, this discrimination index can run from a negative, from a, a value of negative one to positive one, and uh, the closer you are to the middle or so, um, it's better, probably around 0.29 is the ideal, or 0.25 means it's, it's a good uh, correlation of, or good idea of around discrimination. Um, then there's the point by serial correlation coefficient. And this item, this, this uh, tool, basically compares um, performance on a single item to the rest of the exam. And this, this also uh, runs from a negative one to a positive one value. And uh, if you have a positive correlation, that means the top performers on the test did well, when they an did well on the test when they answered this question. If it's an inverse relationship or it's a negative value, that means the bottom performers did better on the assessment when they answered this question. And uh, that could represent there's an issue with your item when you're, uh, when you're looking at the item analysis. And then there's Chromebox Alpha. And the Chromebox Alpha, um, some of you uh, are familiar with this, others aren't. Is anyone here uh, who, didn't, who hasn't heard of the Chromebox Alpha familiar with the KR20? So this provides uh, data on uh, uh, overall um, item analysis. And I'll share these slides with you, uh, but um, for the sake of brevity, uh, we'll, we can look at this example here and be like, all right, so we have 272 res uh, respondents with a p-value of 0.99, discrimination of 0.2, and a, a point by serial value of 0 0.08. So did this item perform well? Yes, because everyone got it right, but only if it's a mastery item. If it was meant to discriminate knowledge, then there may have been an issue. And the idea around looking at all of these data points, even in this other example here, is that um, context is everything when you look at all these data. There's no one piece of data that shows um, the power of, that really shows how effective your assessment was. It's all about context. How did all the individual items perform? And how did uh, this data um, how did the assessment perform as a whole? So we can look at this data for a long time, but I know that a lot of us could probably get cross-eyed. And so I'd rather just us focus in the few minutes we have left uh, around what we're doing to help solve some of these problems. And there's only one way to do that, and that's to do it live. So I am going to uh, log in to an instance of Canvas, 
as a teacher. And we're going to build the test with our new assessment engine. So I'm going to log in to Canvas. We're going to go to an assi our assignment page. And we're going to build a test or a quiz using our new assessment engine. And that's from the assignments page using the new add quiz test button. And from here we can give a title. And we'll say this is worth 15 points. Uh, we can display the grade any way we want now. as a complete or incomplete or grading scheme or per points. And we'll say it's due tomorrow. And we'll go to our new testing engine. So we're launching the new application. Oops. And we're now in a place to build a new test. But rather than create something brand new, I'm going to import a QTI file. So we're going to import content from a QTI file. And you can see I can drag and drop or go to my system file picker. So we're just going to drag and drop that zip file that contains the QTI information and upload a new test. And so we can see the test is now uh, rendered from Canvas. It was a Canvas export and is now rendered inside of our new testing engine. We have our new item navigator uh, where I can manage content. I can also scroll and see the content that was imported uh, into my test uh, or my quiz or my final, whatever you want to call it. You'll notice that we're moving away from calling everything quizzes uh, inside of Canvas. And uh, we have this content. And let's say I really wanted question 10 to be item 1. So all I have to do is drag and drop question 1 all the way up to, uh, let's we'll say item 4 here. Just, I can simply drag and drop that content. Now it's moved. You see now that item has moved. And I can even scroll down to uh, skip and, and work through my assessment. I can do, I can drag and drop uh, from the testing canvas. I can also drag and drop from our, from our home page. And if I want to, um, if I don't have full use of my hands, I can also use the keyboard to drag and drop content. So we actually have access, keyboard accessible drag and drop to manage content. Uh, if I wanted, if I wanted to use that as well, but um, we have our item, our items here. We also want to add content from an item bank. So let's uh, insert some content uh, from an item bank. So we're going to go to our item banks, and we see that we have uh, item banks here. And I'm going to click on a bank, and I'm going to insert some additional content. So we're going to add this categorization item uh, to my quiz, and you'll see that when I've since I've uh, inserted that content, it should now appear in my test, which I think I may have added it twice. There it is. I'm going to delete that. And I can also add additional items. But so we're, and I can also add random items. So let me add a couple random math items from my test. An item bank. And I'm going to add random items. So I'm going to click on all or random. And then I'm going to scroll down and see that I now have a, a, a question group for, all, for my item bank. And I'm going to edit that item bank to say I only want to use randomly selected questions. I'm going to pick two questions from this item bank. And they're going to be worth one point apiece. And so we're now up to 13 or to 14 questions. From here I then have some test settings. I can shuffle all questions. So I have global shuffle. Uh, I can deliver one question at a time or allow or disallow backtracking. I can require a student passcode. And I also have a time limit. So I can say uh, this student is only going to have one minute or two minutes to take this test. And then I have multiple attempts where I can pick the highest, latest, or average score as the score of record. I can have a limited or unlimited number of attempts. And then if I have a uh, like limited number of attempts and I have three attempts, I can also require a waiting period between attempts to say, all right, they have to wait five minutes or five hours or five days between attempts. They can no longer just use all of their attempts back to back. So from here, um, I'm going to turn that off and we'll turn off the, we'll keep the time limit on. 
and we'll shuffle questions. Uh, the nice thing about that is even the questions randomly inserted from your item bank are shuffled globally. So the two questions you have, like numbers 13 and 14, I, I see your question, I'll, I'll get to you in a moment if we have some time, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, so uh, we've built our quiz, and now I'm gonna log in as a student and take that quiz. So I'm in Canvas as a student, I'm going to go to my assignments page, and we can see that we now have that test I just created. So we're going to access that test and begin. It's a two-minute time limit. It's due in one day, and I'm required to submit a passcode. So I enter my passcode, and I submit that, and I'm now able to begin my assessment. From here, uh, as my time limit runs, and I can hide or dismiss that if I want to. It doesn't, uh, it only, and if it's hidden, it stays hidden. I can scroll around and skip um, question to question by using the item bar. If I want to come back to an item, I can simply pin it and come back to that later. Uh, and then I can also just navigate uh, this as a test. So I have my, uh, my matching item. I have a multiple choice question. I have a true false question with uh, an image inserted. And the uh, answer to this question is actually true. Nixon was appointed a special assistant to the DEA. How ironic is that? Um, and then, uh, let's see, I have a numeric response question. Um, of 37, 9, 35 or without error, what is the rate of accuracy? We'll say 92%, even though I know that's wrong. Um, and then, let's see, we'll just... Here we have our new categorization question where you have where you can categorize multiple concepts to a single bucket. So this is a state regulatory authority, federal authority, federal authority, non-regulatory entity, non-regulatory. But again, also, if I don't have the use like really good use of my hands, I have accessible drag and drop. Or I can select from uh, a list and uh, go from there. So I, I have the ability to use my, um, my, key, my keyboard that way as well. And I have 13 seconds left, but I'm gonna go ahead and click Submit. And I didn't answer these questions, so a student now gets a confirmation to say, hey, you didn't answer those questions, you should go back and respond. But we're gonna go ahead and submit. And Everything is automatically graded. So I only got three of 14 points on this quiz. Here's, the, here's my risk feedback for my matching question, the feedback for my multiple choice, true, false. Uh, my numeric response question was automatically graded, and so I got it wrong. It was really supposed to be 95%. And uh, here's this information as well. So I can now see that if I didn't get a response, I can see that information as well. Um, more things to come when it comes to assessment uh, in, in Canvas. We're building out additional functionality for set it and forget it settings for time-based accommodation. So that way if you have a student who requires an accommodation to say they get an additional 20 minutes or they get time and a half on their assessment, you set it once and you're done for your course. It's a sticky setting. The same thing when they have attempt-based accommodations. You set it once and you um, are done uh, for the duration of your course. Uh, we have our formula item is uh, also uh, in the process of being built. And um, item banks follow users. They're no longer associated to courses, so that way whenever you move from course to course, your item banks follow you. Um, we have uh, a bunch of brand new reports. We have a series of brand new item types. I showed you categorization. Uh, we have ordering item types, like uh, fill in, uh, with a list view and a paragraph view. Uh, we have the ability to insert a shared stimulus, so you have a reading passage on the left-hand side of the test and associated questions on the right-hand side of the test. Uh, so that way you have students respond, read a passage and respond to items related to that passage. Um, you have the numeric response item type, and you have the ability to set a numeric answer with uh, precision, uh, significant digits or rounded digits, uh, margin of error, whether that margin of error is an absolute value or a percentage. Um, and uh, the formula-based item that will allow for rounding significant digits, uh, including units of measure, uh, all sorts of things. Um, and so 
Uh, our essay question that will allow you to enforce a word count. You can show a minimum, a maximum word count to the student uh, and set a minimum or, ma or required length uh, for that. Uh, if a student doesn't meet that requirement, they can still submit the test, but the instructor and the student are both alerted that you didn't, you didn't meet the minimum or you exceeded the maximum requirement for that response as well. So lots of uh, amazing things coming to, a, to the, the new assessment engine. Um, some additional reports. Uh, so we have our, our outcomes analysis, which um, I, don't, I, don't, I can't show this to you today because it hasn't run yet, but it's a mastery dashboard that lists every student who sat for that test and their mastery of outcomes uh, that were assessed on that, uh, on that test. Um, and then also uh, our real-time item, anal item analysis. I don't have any data in here yet to show you. But to show you distribution, the point by serial, the Cronbach alpha, difficulty and discrimination indices, correct and incorrect responses, performance by quintile uh, on an assessment. Um, the one thing I didn't show you that I'll show you right now is that when I am authoring a question, and we'll go to the authoring view of this categorization question. Uh, actually, it's a banked item, so I won't do that. But we'll go to this multiple choice question here. When I edit uh, or author a question, I can now align in each item uh, two learning outcomes. So one item to one or uh, each item can be aligned to one or many learning outcomes within the testing uh, tool itself. And I'll just pick some arbitrary outcomes here. I can then pick uh, one or many uh, learning outcomes. You can see that I've selected three learning outcomes, not just the two. And then I can align those selected outcomes and they're now attached to that one item. Uh, inside of the quiz. And then the data in that outcomes mastery dashboard is what populates and will show you learning mastery. Uh, and I can also align outcomes to uh, the overall test as well. So um, that's what we're doing to help positively affect assessment inside of Canvas as a brand new learning engine or brand new assessment engine uh, to quantify the uh, acquisition of knowledge in classrooms with all the necessary reporting at the course level to help you understand uh, how your students are performing and how we can make a uh, more significant impact upon their learning process. Um, I know that we have one question. Ma'am, did you like that? You okay. Um, oh, yes, ma'am. Question? Not yet. We're, we're in the process of, um, of figuring out the best way to do that. We just want to make sure the images are sized. When you insert your images, they size appropriately. But uh, I have, but yes, we're working on that problem. Other questions? In the very back? Uh, that's a great question. So first of all, let me repeat this question for, the, for those who, uh, who aren't here with us. Uh, the first question was to the ability to insert images into items like matching. And we're working on that process. And the next question was, um, do we have the ability to create custom item types using LTI? Uh, the answer to that is no. However, not LTI. We are in the process of uh, designing and thinking about an integration framework that would allow you to build custom item types that appear as native item types inside of the testing engine. We'll have more to share about that in the coming year. But uh, that would allow uh, institutions such as yourselves to build your own item types, uh, and then also third-party applications to build custom item types that could be integrated with the testing engine as well. So um, it wouldn't be through LTI, it would be through a native uh, integration framework. And uh, we'll have more to share on, uh, about that in a, a year or so. Another question? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question was around uh, integration of third-party applications like Respondus. Can I use a Respondus item type inside of quizzes? Will it? migrate over using the import form, the import process. Uh, the answer to that is it's up to Respondus. Um, we are, the uh, Respondus, uh, if I recall now, uh, supports QTI 1.2. Uh, we support QTI 2.x, 2.1 and 2.2. So they would need to update their tools and then they also need to rebuild their integration for the new testing engine. And we're in the process of having that conversation with all of our partners because uh, the APIs and the way to access the new testing engine one more question. So the question was, when is this supposed to launch? And we're, at, we're currently in beta today with several clients. 
And we're in the process of uh, taking requests as institutions request, uh, make the request to their CSM. We'll partner with institutions to uh, bring them into the, to the beta. Um, there is an agreement process that ha we have to go through, and it, it's for the entire institution. We're not doing it department by department. Um, but it would be up to the institution if they want to come on early in the beta, uh, or if they'd rather take it when we're generally available. And our current expectation for general availability is early next year, in January. But I, I, that's our current expectation, and that date may change. So with that, I have one more thing I'd like to show you. So I'm in this quiz. I'm in uh, this. I'm in Canvas as a student, and I have one more quiz I'd like to take, and it's about anatomy. And I'm going to take this quiz. So I'm just going to begin and I'm presented with an ultrasound of a heart. And I'm, and I'm being asked you know, to identify, or click on the image to identify the tricuspid valve. This is a hotspot item that supports GIF images. So, now you're gonna know I'm gonna get this wrong, and that's okay. So I'm gonna think about this for a second, and I'm gonna look at identifying the tricuspid valve. And I didn't study, so I'm just gonna click here. And I'm going to keep my fingers crossed and hope that's right. And I can click anywhere. And it's the last click that I pick. And I'm going to submit. Oh, I got it wrong, of course. This is the correct answer. This is the answer I selected. And then I also have feedback where I can say where I'm now presented with an image and some feedback based upon the based upon the, the my response. So I have I can provide feedback that's correct or incorrect for a correct or incorrect response as well as overall feedback. And I should have I should have read chapter five more carefully. Oh goodness. So uh, this is our new hotspot interaction. It supports images as well as GIFs. So that way um, we can show live anatomy and other live functions uh, in, a, in a hotspot interaction. So with that, uh, I'll just say thank you so much for your time today. Uh, if you have any other questions, I'll stick around for a little bit. But uh, thank you so much for your time.